Philadelphia Communications presents this interesting special about the Green Party. You know, we all know about Democrats. We know about Republicans. We know about Democrats. We know about Republicans. We just saw the Democrats and Republicans in California decide to redistrict the state, so they made it safe for themselves. The Incumbent Protection Act, we call it. There were 157 races on the last November ballot, of which only nine had any competition. So if you're a Democrat, you kind of do it in the primary. You're a Republican, you do it in the primary, and you kind of win in the fall. That's what's become of our two-party system. Many of us know that in other places of the planet, there's a pluralism, there's a plethora of parties, there's coalition building. People participate more robustly in the political process. And then one of the parties that stands out all over the planet is the Green Party. It's located now in 90 countries. In this great country of ours, we have 175 elected officials in 24 states that are in the Green Party. They're on county boards of supervisors, they're school boards, they're, they're on water boards, they're on city councils. They get elected and they're getting elected in greater numbers. It's a grassroots effort. We all know about the national scene with Ralph Nader in 96 and in 2000 with Ralph Nader, but we don't know what's really happening in our country in terms of beyond Democrats and Republicans. Well, the Greens have come to town. They're having a national conference here in California, and folks from around the world actually are also here with them. And we're honored to be able to have five Greens here, various parts of the political process from our great country with us, and they are. We'll start right to my right, and you see Annie Young, and she's on the Parks and Recreation board member in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Good to have you. Thanks. Julie Jacobson, she's a retired county council member in Hawaii County in Hawaii. Good to have you. Thank you. Mark Sanchez, he's from the San Francisco Board of Education. Good to have you, Mark. Michael Feinstein, those of us in the LA area know him. He's a city council member in the city of Santa Monica. And sitting right next to me is Matt Gonzalez. He's president of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. Mr. President, good to have you. Thank you. you. Thank That's you. a powerful spot, isn't it? Boy, that title just rolls off the tongue, My doesn't God, it? My God, Mr. President, <laughs> yeah, what's it like? Well, it's been interesting. I thought the power of the board president would come from committee assignments and things of the like, but it actually comes from your colleagues having to talk to you about how to move legislation mm -hmm. through the process. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. How big of a, a supervised group? I don't understand the politics. Well, in, <laughs> board of, how many are on the board? In San Francisco, it's a city and county combined into one. So we don't have a city council. We just have the board of supervisors. It's 11 members elected by districts. I was elected in a district that includes the Haight-Ashbury, the Western edition, and um, I was elected by my colleagues to be the board president. So then this city council, then, uh, county supervisors, has a relationship with the mayor of the city as well? That's right. The, mayor, that? the okay. mayor can veto uh, legislation that we pass, uh, that we pass by majority, let's say six to five. If he vetoes it, we can override the veto by a uh, super majority, which is eight out of the 11 votes. Now, how does a Green become head of the, when there's usually Democrats and Republicans? Well, uh, I'm proud to say that uh, I probably was elected in spite of being in the Green Party, mm. uh, although I think that the Green Party had an impact on my colleagues, not because of they support the progressive ideals of the party, but I think they like the way a Green Party official engages in politics. I'm very honest. I tell people what I think. Uh, I can change my mind if I'm persuaded that I should. But at the end of the day, they know that there's not behind the scenes deal making and they can trust my word. And so when they're trying to find a parliamentarian, someone who's making committee assignments, uh, I think uh, it's not too surprising that they chose someone that uh, does politics that way. Now, hearing that, Michael, uh, two questions for you. Um, you know, a lot of people kind of say they're falling away Catholics. I mean, falling away Democrats yeah. become Greens, right? They, they're they're, they're, they're um, Democrats, but they're closet Greens. Or, or they, 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 they're folks who felt that the ideals and the values that the Democratic Party stood for, uh, they don't, and they became Greens. I mean, you hear this, you see this, but when you stand upright, most people will be the Democrat or the Republican. Define a Green. Well, the Green Party is based on four key values, ecology, 
social justice, grassroots democracy, and nonviolence. And we, re we really believe that by engaging all the people who are affected by public policy, we have the best chance to get policy that works for everybody. So we work on those issues and we work on improving the democratic process. And I think Matt getting chosen as he was is a reflection of the fact that our commitment to internal democracy in our party, our commitment to democratic institutions and society is what people respect across political lines. But that sounds great, but look, the Democrats and Republicans in California just shut everybody out but themselves and created these safe districts. How do you penetrate that? Right. The way that we penetrate that is by having a locally oriented electoral strategy. The coverage, as you mentioned, goes to Ralph Nader, goes to our higher level uh, office type candidates. But on a municipal level, we can run, we can win, we can show that we can govern credibly. Over 90% of our elected officials are returned to office, uh, an incumbents at re-election rate. Mm -hmm. We had 42 electeds after the 96 election, 85 electeds after the 2000 election. Now we're up to 175 people. Each cycle we're getting more and more. We're building credibility. More people of talent are now starting to self-identify as Greens because they're seeing the Green at their local city council or other municipal office showing that not only, not only are these good ideas, but they're practical, they make sense, and it actually func functions for the government. Uh, Annie, you, you guys had produced Jesse Ventura, is that right? Oh, yes. Now, the way we he was ended back. up <laughs> being governor, frankly, was some smart guy or gal who is involved with putting debates together uh, let him come into the room and sit at the table with the Democrat and the Republican. All of a sudden, he hit a, a nerve of people outside of the room. So, my God, there's only these Democrats. Now I see this, this crazy guy. He's smart. He's articulate. He's independent. He, nobody owns him. There was a surge of energy. This independent, out of the blue, becomes the governor of your state. Then, just most recently, we saw Paul Wellstone uh, get killed in a plane crash, and out comes a former vice president to go against the Republican, Republican wins. So your state goes up and down and around and this and that. And, and tell me about the Greens, how they've made an impact in, in Minnesota. Well, it isn't just the Democrats, but what's happened, I believe, is that the progressive voice of the entire state has went somewhere into the sunset. Uh, uh, one thing that's happened is Minnesota has really grown. People from both coasts have come to the middle part of the country. And with them, they have brought their conservative Republican values, many of them, and are living in so the suburbs. Minneapolis is now the Twin City area is one of the growing, most populated areas and uh, suffering from urban sprawl in all of America. Mm. Number one traffic, we're the worst drivers in America, was just announced a couple mm. weeks ago. Uh, so this has all happened in Minneapolis, which or the metro area, and yet Minneapolis is considered one of the greenest cities in America because of its beautiful parks and because of the Mississippi River and uh, our love for, you know, the whole renewable energy thing is very big because we've got the wind out there on the plains that could provide uh, renewable energy probably for the entire country. Mm -hmm. um, but it's that progressive voice that's been lost. They went back to Walter Mondale, Mr. Retread. They use all the retreads to bring back the old white Democrats. People are really tired of that. Mid mid the Midwest is as diverse so as Santa words, Monica. The Greens are the, are the straight shooters when it comes back to the, the Just old like issues. Matt said, we believe in building coalitions. We believe in an open process. We believe in including everybody. I come, on a, I come from a board right now that has a vacancy, and we're tied 4-4, and it's unbearable. Uh, to be in a situation where you're deadlocked and can't move. And part of that is being closed out of the process. Uh, hearing that, uh, in Hawaii, are you closed out of the process? Uh, what strides have you made? Well, it's a mix. Uh, certainly we have actually, my, most of my colleagues in my years and, and now in my husband's term, are very conservative and very pro-development and um, always make the argument of jobs over the environment but we change the dialogue and we change sometimes on the smaller things we are able to make progress and we're actually I think able to bridge with to some degree our state government but even our federal government the expansion of the um, cultural park Pu'u um, Honu'o Kalani which is a ancient Hawaiian area is now expanding by about a couple hundred acres. Well, we'd want about 400 acres more, but who came together on this is the uh, native Hawaiians who felt that their ancestral lands were being threatened, their ancestral burial areas, and so we can come together and help on some issues when it isn't always legislative victories, and sometimes maybe it's even a matter of um, do less damage. Sometimes we can take something that would have been awful and make it um, 
less harmful. And mm. so I think it's um, coming together in many, many forces. We're one of the most multi multi multicultural, yeah. multi-ethnic, um, even environmentally very diverse. So it's... We love your state, frankly. We are across the river here, I call it, the pond out there. We're, we're the closest to you, and boy, right. I go there anytime I can. Uh, Mark, uh, San Francisco um, is considered a liberal town anyhow to begin with. Uh, so what, what do you bring to the mix of, 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 of points of view uh, that get you elected, and how do you differ from the Democrats? Well, I got elected as a Democrat, actually, in a nonpartisan race for the school board, and changed uh, before I got sat. So in between getting elected and being sat on the board, I changed Why? stripes. Um, basically because um, the Demo I've, I've always been very, very progressive, and I feel that the Democrats haven't done enough, especially for children in this state where I live, where we've had a Democratic governor who is not doing right by the kids here. And I taught elementary school in San Francisco, so I felt that to, to, to get my voice heard better, I, I needed to join the Green Party and stand out. And it's, it's working. Bill, I, I should just say that I, I watch that race very carefully being in San Francisco. Uh, the Democrats didn't support Mark. Uh, he actually was able to build a very independent progressive coalition in his election and the Greens uh, were with him and very supportive. And so I think it was a good example where the Greens decided to weigh into a progressive race and really ultimately uh, you know, got, were the beneficiaries of that victory. What's a and progressive? I think it's a, prog a progressive is somebody that uh, has certain social ideas more than anything uh, that are not uh, as equivocal, let's say, as the other parties. For the Greens, some of those ideals would be uh, supporting gay marriage, being opposed to the death penalty. You know, some very fundamental ideas. There's a difference between a liberal and a progressive. Well, liberal says it and the progressive does it. The, li say the liberal says it and talks about it and the progressive does it. Um, for instance, what, what do you mean? Well, you know, you, you can say that you're for uh, health care for everybody, but then do a gutless thing like Clinton did in office in 93 and come up with a, a terrible plan which alienated everybody from health care reform for decades. Uh, you know, as Greens, we're for universal health care. It means everybody gets covered. It doesn't mean these incremental nonsense plans that the Democrats put forward year after year, which doesn't do anything for real people at home. We either stand for something or you stand for nothing. Julie? I had an example, too. Um, I think as Greens, we wanted campaign finance reform. The Greens, um, well, my husband hasn't yet. He's only been in office a couple of years. But the two of us who were elected introduced conflict of interest legislation um, to reduce the influence of uh, big money on campaigns. The other parties would talk about it, would say it's a good idea, but they'd always backtrack and say, well, it's just not you haven't fine-tuned it enough is the common expression and so when it came actually to, it was so perfect to the action we were willing to stick our necks out and do all we could to try to get things passed and um, we don't see that in other parties and I think the other two things Bill what yeah, I wanted I mean, to say on on his is uh, that when I was a Democrat uh, that was just kind of the status quo but when we, you become a green people listen because all of a sudden you are different, and so it allows us to have kind of this soapbox. But I think the other mm. thing about the progressive liberal idea is the fact that we are pushing an agenda, and we have common bonds. As he said, the four pillars are a common bond. And when I said before what happened in Minnesota, what the, the progressives lost their voice, was that's exactly what happened, is that the voice, just as Julie says, just kind of gets swept swept in and w that's what makes the Greens so vibrant right now. Okay, well help me out on this. Um, uh, we are a two-party system in this country and some people say, love it or leave it, it's your problem. And then others will say, well Bill, it's the lesser of two evils, you know, da 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 da. And then we go down to Florida, okay? And people are still saying that if those 95,000 folks who voted for Ralph Nader had voted proportionately to give Gore his vote, Al Gore would be president, not this guy Bush. This is one line you hear. Then the other line you hear, well, with Bill, in places around the country, uh, around the world, they have instant runoff voting, and they also have proportional representation. Now, I know Israel has a coalition government, and I know that in places where, where they do have instant runoff voting or, or proportional representation, there's a greater robustity of voter participation. But look, 
How do you get Americans to buy it? Now, I just heard, and we all know this, that in California, on the election that's going to be this November, the 4th, that there is a, a, a piece on the ballot called instant runoff voting. Now, how is that going to work? Well, instant runoff voting was passed by the voters in San Francisco last March. It will take effect this November. Um, one thing I think it's interesting when you consider what happened in Florida, the Democrats are very good at blaming Nader, uh, but they're not very good at coming forward with a solution. Instant runoff voting is a method of voting that's currently used in Australia. It elected the mayor of London, the president of Ireland. And what you do is, rather than going to vote in November and either having a plurality victory, as we have in the national presidential races, uh, where a plurality gets you the entire state, um, you would go into the booth and you, you rank your choices. You might say, well, I want Nader first, Gore second, whoever third. We only count your first place vote, your first choice. You, you do that calculus, if nobody has 50% of the vote, 50% plus one, then you eliminate the bottom vote getter. Let's say Nader's on the bottom, get rid of him, go to all of those ballots, second choice. Some of them will be for Gore, some will be for Buchanan, some will be for Bush, and you recalculate it. And you do that until you have somebody over 50% and you have a winner. Uh, how do you deal with this uh, proportional representation? What's that? Well, proportional representation in the United States, I think, has a pretty bad uh, reputation because people see the European governments and they say, oh, my God, nobody's Chaos. governing. Right. But if you look at the system they use in New Zealand, it's what they call an MPP system, where they actually split their... Uh, seats in Congress or Parliament so that half are elected in single member districts like we do here, like you go and you vote for who you want your congressperson to be, but the other half are done by proportion. So when you go vote, you vote for the single member district, but you cast a second vote for what party you want to represent you. And it's that party uh, that's done proportionally. So if the Greens have 5% of the vote, they pick up 5% of that second half of the parliament uh, seats. Bill, right. Bill yes. you know, to add, add to the proportional representation, the thing yeah. that people get confused on in this country, which mm -hmm. is important to, to bring out, is that a parliamentary system isn't a proportional system. A parliamentary system is where the chief executive, like the president, is chosen by the legislature. Yeah. In our country, we choose the president separately or the governor separately. So we can use proportional representation in our legislature, pick 20% of the, the vote Greens, we get 20% of the seats, but the chief executive doesn't rise or fall on whether the coalition of people who appointed that person, she or he, stays together. Yeah. So we would have the best of all systems. We'd have the stability of a separately elected executive, but we'd have a proportional legislature here. And that's the route that the Green Party is trying to go. And when you get back to your progressive versus liberal stuff, on the municipal level, we get elected, we can force that point of view and have that discussion. Unlike pro uh, where there aren't programs like yours, the best public affairs programming in the United States, the stranglehold that the corporate media has on dialogue means that we aren't even part of the national debate, let alone getting elected, even though we should be in the Congress today and leading the peace movement and talking about the cost of war. Mark, on the school board in San Francisco, has helped push that sort of issue on a municipal level. We don't have people like that on the federal level. Well, you know what's also interesting is uh, the idea of a constitutional convention for America. Here we have the internet, we have all this high tech. Uh, going back to quote our founding fathers, unquote, and taking a document that hasn't really changed in a couple of hundred years and say we need to look at it in light of the reality today. For instance, states' rights over the, the unity of the national government. Why should California, which has 35 million people, has two senators, you could put 24 states in California that add up to 35 million people, they have 48 senators. So right. we don't have one person, one vote. Secondly, uh, Al Gore wins five, 600,000 more popular votes than, 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 than George W. And yet the popular vote doesn't count because we believe in the Electoral College. But if anybody attacks the Electoral College or states' rights, meaning the United States Senate, or even this last presidential election, they're commies, or we used to be pinkos. Now they're greens. Right, right, so, right. so at least you got the name green rather than pinko. No. But, 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 but this concept of revolution, meaning involvement, changing the Constitution, right. modifying it, bringing it up to where Europeans are, where a lot of these countries that have become part of the, 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 the worldwide scene have become. Will we ever break through this? No, I don't think here. <laughs> I really don't. I think that the Democrats and the Republicans have such a stranglehold on the two-party system because the threshold, there is no 
floor. There's no threshold that you have to get over to make it a legitimate vote. We could, we're down to what, 35% of the popular vote or people who are registered or who could be registered voting? That's right. It could be 20%. It could be 10%. And the reason why is because I think is because big money buys the election. Well, saying that, but look at you. Here you are. You are one of the most powerful elected officials in the country being president uh, of, of this city council, county, city government, and you're a green. Now, don't you show as a role model that you can work with everybody and put coalitions together? Could that not give hope to the idea sure. of a more pluralistic strategy? Look, Bill, my, my thinking when, with instant runoff voting, uh, and I was the lead sponsor of it, was if we can get a municipality like San Francisco to adopt it, there'll be increasing pressure on the, on the national level for that to be implemented. People say the Greens are, you know, the communist or Marxist or this or that. Right. Let me tell you, I don't think the Greens hold a single radical opinion. We really don't. It's usually the speed with which we want to make change. And I would think that any uh, rational, educated, uh, decent human being living in the United States looking at the political process would say, oh my God, the way you elect a president in this country is insane. It's not, e even though you mentioned Gore beat Bush in the popular vote, neither of them won a majority of the vote. I think in a democracy, it's got to be uh, a majority victory. And so I think the Greens are the only ones stepping forward. In Alaska, interestingly enough, mm -hmm. there was an instant runoff voting uh, measure that went to the voters. It would have applied to federal elections. The Democratic Party opposed it. So now you're going to have what? A convention this weekend. What do you hope to accomplish at this convention? Well, one of the things that we're trying to do is have more of the elected Greens who are scattered across the entire country to meet each other and learn the practical things that they're doing on a day to day basis to work better for their communities and to improve our performance as Greens and to expand our numbers. Number two, we're actually putting together a Green Office Holders Network so we can ongoingly not only work together but publicize our work around the country, not just to other Greens, but why aren't we in People Magazine? Why aren't we in Cosmo? Why aren't we in regular places having people being profiled? Why aren't we in Seventeen Magazine? I mean, we have a ton. We, we had a uh, Green at 20 years old getting elected in Pennsylvania. Uh, Heather Urkersky in this last race this past year. And one of the interesting things about the hope of the party demographically is that younger people are registering Green in much larger numbers. And instead of trying to convince people who have traditionally voted Democrat or Republican for 40, 50 years, now we're getting people, their first time votes are Greens to start with. So I think we're a demographic shift also, it's in our favor. Well, when they vote for you uh, or young people are candidates and get elected, what are the half a dozen reasons why young people who are the least likely to vote would be a Green or vote for a Green? You mentioned the death penalty, um, you mentioned health care. What are some other issues? Where, where are you with this rock business? I'll let someone well, Mark, I'm well, I don't know that one. You know, the Greens on our board, there's two Greens on the school board in San Francisco, led the charge to, A, come out against what we're doing in Iraq and in the Middle East in general, and also against the military being able to recruit out of our high schools, which they can now with the new um, No Child Left Behind mm -hmm. law, which is the federal law. So we're trying to in a way, subvert you know, that law because we don't want the military to have access to 9th grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade records mm -hmm. and be able to call these folks at home. We just think that that's a civil liberties <laughs> issue and we're going to stand up for our kids. Julie, I just heard civil liberties. What are other issues the Greens um, are espousing that could attract people? Well, I was going to go with the, one of the big ones to me is labor and that I think young people are realizing that they're really being left out of basic um, things that are I guess my parents' generation and some of my generation, although it's, they're losing it, but with the move towards privatization, towards gutting health care for new workers, um, even just secure job security and those kind of things. And these are things that they see now that they're entering the workforce and having a difficult time and things that they saw that their parents could count on and that led them to have a stable middle class life. And I think they're you know, looking to someone to talk about that and talk about that, and just like you said, not as a piecemeal uh, drug insurance for the elderly, but health care for everyone. That young people are getting, you know, various. I mean, the health issues are changing, so young people are facing major uh, issues that they weren't maybe as a group is aware of. And what about our course, group? What well, about our age bracket? Well, why, our, why would we want to be a green? <laughs> well, because we're wise. And the word, when you talk about uh, the overall umbrella, still of the Greens, is about the environment. And the, one of our four pillars is called ecological wisdom. And we as elders have wisdom. I have some wisdom that I learned in my 35 years as a Democrat. 
but now I'm using it to help, to mentor, to teach these young people who've never been in a political party. So why'd you go from a Democrat to, to Green? Because I was frustrated with the progressive issues, moving the social issues. I come from the most diverse, poorest neighborhood in, uh, in the state of Minnesota, other than the, the uh, Indian reservations. And um, I just, uh, our town was doing development, you know, development, 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 and leaving our jobs and affordable housing behind. And uh, I, we have a machine, we have a democratic machine in, uh, in our city, and I, as I said, it's been falling apart and crumbling, and there, it's not meaning very much to be an endorsed Democrat anymore, and people are looking to the new hope. I think, you know, when we talk about Iraq, when we talk about education, when we talk about health care, reasons we get up in the morning is because we have hope. We believe in our platform, we believe in these four pillars. It's one of the common reasons. You get 175 Greens together, you will find our common, we find our common threads and Matt, work on those. Last comment. Greens, well, why green? I, I'm optimistic. I, I think uh, young people uh, don't see, generally if you ask them, if you ask anybody to name a politician that they admire, nobody can come up with one. Or they come up with a name uh, of someone that's long gone that they've kind of romanticized. And that's because there's so much dirty money in politics that we're never going to fix the system until we get true electoral reform, campaign finance reform. Mm -hmm. Mark Green in The Nation recently, the failed uh, uh, mayoral candidate in New York, yeah, right. had a wonderful line where he said, you know, the Democrats have a solution and they, you know, put up the flag talking about how great it is, but it's like throwing a, a buoy to a drowning person. You throw it 20 feet out, they're 40 feet away, and you call it a success. That's not the kind of party I want to be a member of. You know, I want Last to try comment, to Michael. We're the party for public financing. Uh, Democrats talk campaign finance reform, but they really aren't committed to take the money out of politics. We are. Well, I want to thank five of you very much. Thank you. Uh, shaking your hands symbolically for everybody around the table. <laughs> um, we need to have the discourse in a democracy. We need to, to get everybody to participate and appreciate what you're doing to bring people into the political process. Appreciate it very much. And I especially want to thank you out there for sharing your time with us. God bless you and bye-bye. <laughs>